Hey gang, welcome to the Worksheet Solutions Walkthrough for Radical Stability and Free Radical Halogenation. So for those who are unfamiliar with a Worksheet Solutions Walkthrough, you've probably seen the worksheet, you looked at the answers, you may be a little bit unsure of how some of those answers were arrived at. We are in the right place, we're gonna go do the worksheet, go over the explanations, and hopefully clear up any confusion you may have. Let's do it. Okay gang, in problem one, we are given, so we've two things to do. We have to rank these radicals, right? Radical being a, an atom with an unpaired electron. We have to rank them in terms of stability, one being the least stable, four being the most. And then in the second part of problem one, the most stable structure, the structure ranked fourth, we need to just explain why. Explain the stability. Why is it so stable? What makes it tick? Okay? So, we mentioned terminology meaning like for primary carbons, secondary carbons, tertiary carbons, quaternary carbons. It's just based on you as a carbon, how many other carbons are you attached to? If it's one, you're primary. If it's two, you're secondary. Three, tertiary, and so on. So radical stability goes up the more carbons you're attached to, the more you're, the more substituted you are, we can say, right? The more carbons you're uh, you know, bonded to, the more substituted you are. So this is pretty easy. This is a methyl carbon. This is a primary carbon, a secondary carbon, and a tertiary carbon. So methyl is the least stable. Tertiary is the best out of here. And then of course, it goes methyl to primary to secondary to tertiary. And now in B, we need to explain why that tertiary carbon, that you know, radical, is as stable as it is, especially being better than these other options. And this is just a nice refresher of hyperconjugation. So if you knew the answer was due to hyperconjugation, but you kind of forgot how to explain it, don't worry, we're just we're we're right about to do it. Okay? So it's because of hyperconjugation. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of draw a uh, me looking at this ring, but from this perspective. So if I were to draw this ring like so, I'm going to put the radical electron right here. So this carbon and radical carbons in general are sp2 hybridized because there's one bonding area, a second bonding area, and a third bonding area. So they are trigonal planar. The bond angles are 120 degrees, right? We know that from our VSEPR knowledge. But the reason why it's sp2 hybridized is because there is an unhybridized p orbital that houses that radical electron. Don't think of that as like an actual organic chemistry arrow. I was just pointing a P at the uh, radical electron. So there's a P orbital right here that's just, it's not empty, but it just has one electron in it. So hyperconjugation is the fact that this electron has no P orbital pair. It's not a pi bond, it's just a P orbital with a lone electron. So this unhybridized P orbital that houses this radical electron, the more neighbors that this carbon has, right, this carbon has two, I'm gonna draw the bonds right here, but that carbon has its own hybrid orbital overlapping with the S orbital from hydrogen, the hydrogen that's, that's there. So this, you know, there's two CH bonds right here. There are three on this CH3 right here, and there's two right here. I'm drawing this kind of crudely. Point being is that these bonds are rotating all the time, and for a split second, every once in a while, each of these bonds, each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bonds will have a, a moment where they become parallel with this p orbital housing this electron. I, I drew this kind of huge. And for a split second, any of these bonds, when they be, do become parallel with this p orbital, it mimics a pi bond. So that provides stability. That's a stabilizing factor, uh, has a stabilizing effect. So the more of those interactions you have available, the greater chance every given second that they can actually occur and provide stability. So the, basically, the more neighbors you have as a carbon that is a radical, the more hydrogens should be available or just bonds to other atoms that can, for a flicker of a second, become parallel with your unhybridized p orbital that has an electron and mimic a pi bond and give you stability. So there are many neighbors, many options for that to occur. So that's your chances are higher when you're tertiary because you have more neighbors and more CH bonds or just C whatever bonds. Um, then you have 
you, you, that, that's best when you're tertiary. It's better, it, it, it's okay when you're secondary. It gets worse when you're primary, and it's impossible when you're methyl. You have no neighbors, okay? So it's because of hyperconjugation, and it's this fleeting effect, right? I just wanna make sure it's just for a second, and it's because that these bonds can rotate, right? They're rotating, so, you know, it's rotating, 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 flicker, rotating, flicker, okay? Just making sure that's, uh, yeah, it makes sense, okay? That's problem one, on to two. Okay, gang, I know these videos can get long, and I know that this mechanism is already in Joe Kim videos, so I'm not gonna explain it. Well, I'm gonna explain it, but I'm not gonna draw it, redraw it. So, problem two is just draw the mechanism for this chlorination, and really this is just this free radical chlorination, and this is meant just to be practice, right? You will get asked this question on your first exam. It's not, it's not a question of if, it's when. Uh, you have to face it, do you know it? And if you put in the time, it's free points. Uh, so I recommend that you do that and you, you know, grab that low-hanging fruit. So easy, you know, this is, this is you know, the first mechanism you're most likely going to learn in OCHEM 1, your organic career. So it goes in a bunch of steps. So I would say these three steps and then you will, you know, you will usually be asked to provide a termination step. But for free radical chlorination, bromination, in this case we just need light. Light is enough to actually cleave this bond, homolytically meaning, right, that each, the bond splits equally in the same way, not heterolytically where one atom gets both electrons. So we use single-headed arrows to show that one electron in, in this bond that has two electrons goes to this chlorine and one goes to that chlorine, single-headed arrows. So we get two chlorine radicals, right, because six, you know, so we have six electrons in these lone pairs. So once we, each atom gets one, we have an unpaired electron, aka a radical. In propagation one, P1, you enter in your organic piece, right, your carbon piece, and this chlorine is just going to abstract or pluck this hydrogen off of this piece. Now, it can be a little confusing, right? This, these arrows are showing that chlorine is meeting up with hydrogen, and hydrogen is taking one of its, you know, one electron for itself out of this bond to bond with chlorine. So we have an H, I'm actually supposed to draw it, an HCl bond that forms each atom needs to come with one electron if you're using these single-headed arrows, which is the case for us here. So the leftover one electron in this bond goes to that carbon. So we then produce a carbon radical, okay? Carbon radicals are reactive, right? It's not just gonna sit around and wait. So what's the most abundant thing around it? Because in P2, a common mistake is for this radical right here to bump into a chlorine radical. But if you think about it, when this reaction starts, chlorine radicals are in very low concentration. Right? We have Cl2 everywhere, so that's what this carbon radical is going to find first, is a, chlorine, a Cl2, uh, a diatomic chlorine molecule. So it's going to pluck, abstract a chlorine from the Cl2. This chlorine is gonna take one electron from this bond that has two, meet up, form a bond, that's how we get the carbon Cl bond. And this is a chain reaction, and that's, you know, that's a very common follow-up question. Why is it a chain reaction? Because by the nature of doing it, you produce chlorine radicals, which is what initiation does in the first place. So in theory, you only need initiation to happen once to get this ball rolling, because by the nature of P1 and P2 occurring, you make the very thing that gets this reaction to go in the first step of P1. And in termination, you can basically smush any two radicals together. The easiest answer is to always just do Cl, Cl, or whatever halogen you're working with, smush them together, terminate, right, when two radicals hit each other, no additional radicals produced, so the reaction stops. But we're not stopping. Problem three, let's go. Okay, gang, so for problem three, very similarly to two, we're working with bromine now. There's obviously a little twist, because we know bromine is a little bit different than chlorine when it comes to free radical halogenation. Okay, so in this problem, we see we have propane, and by doing free radical bromination, we end up with not propyl bromide, but, and we know why, but, and we'll rehash why, but we end up with isopropyl bromide, okay? Remember, bromine's pickier, and we'll get into that. So to go through the mechanism, which is the, exactly the same as chlorination, know them both, they're the same, right? So you don't need to really practice both, but just remember the difference between them, but know the mechanism. Initiation, exactly the same. Homolytic cleavage of this bond, each atom gets one electron, use single-headed arrows in this mechanism. P1, exactly the same. Your, the radical you produce in initiation will come, it'll find your organic piece, it'll find your carbon piece, it will abstract a hydrogen, right? Remember, hydrogen takes one electron from the CH bond it's part of, meets up with bromine, and its one electron 
we form HBr, we form a bond. The remaining electron in this bond, it gets, it gets off, it goes on to the carbon. So make sure to point your arrow at the carbon, not in between, actually at that carbon. We produce a carbon radical. In P2, that carbon radical sees all this abundant Br2 around. It goes, this would be lovely to react with. And it is extremely reactive, so it will. It abstracts a bromine. Bromine takes one electron from this bond, meets up, we form a CBr bond. We, we form our, an, our alkyl halide, right? Our alkane halogen piece. And we then, obviously, we know this is a chain reaction, so we produce Br radical. The whole party keeps on going and the termination step would be smushing bromine and bromine together. Okay, for B, right, why is bromine more selective than chlorine? Remember, it comes down to the fact that you can look at the bond dissociation energies. If you actually calculated the enthalpy for the steps in P1 and P2, you actually see that one of the steps for bromine is endothermic. The bromination reaction is less exothermic. It doesn't happen as rapidly as the chlorination reaction. It, you know, it putters along. It doesn't have as much, you know, Energy, you know, wonderful energy release and, and rapid reaction as does the chlorine reaction. So, when this step occurs, bromine, so, and I like to explain this with an energy diagram, which is why I made a separate video on making sure we understood how, you know, and we're comfortable with looking at energy diagrams. And this step, we want to break, because bond breaking is an endothermic process. Bonds just don't explode, right? You need to put energy in to break them because we're going to take this propane stable on its own, and we're about to make a propane radical. So if you think about it, right, we have something here at some type of energy level, and we're about to make it more unstable. We're about to raise its energy, right? To go from this to a radical like this, I'm gonna draw this in blue, the line, right? This is an energy gap. That energy has to come from somewhere, a delta E, if you will. Where does that come from? Well, that's provided, right? Like that is, that energy has to come from somewhere. It's not free. So since this reaction is less exothermic, right? Is it easier to make this secondary radical or is it easier to make a primary radical? Well, we know because of our knowledge of hyperconjugation, the more substituted a carbon is, the more stable it is as a radical. Radicals are unstable, but if you're more substituted, you're better off than if you're less substituted in a radical. So you can see it takes more energy to produce a, I'm gonna do primary, and this will be secondary. It takes more energy to break a CH bond for on a primary carbon than a secondary carbon because you need to, because the primary radical is gonna be more unstable. That difference in energy needs to come in to break that bond. So it's easier to break the CH bond in the secondary situation and because the brom bromination reaction is less exothermic, right, we're really trying to be frugal with our energy. So bromine's always gonna, in the bromination reaction, you're always going to look to stick the bromine on the more substituted carbon because that carbon's gonna be the easiest to convert to a radical, okay? Just to make sure, I probably explained this a bunch of times, it is kind of hard to wrap your head around, but once you get it, you get it. Okay, gang, we're gonna do some of our first complete the reaction questions. Let's finish this worksheet with some complete the reaction questions. Okay, so if we take a look at what is going on, we have a bunch of starting material, we have a reaction error with some conditions, and we need to provide the, the product that this reaction will produce, this reaction will produce. So in this first problem, so you will, uh, you wanna, at least in this scenario, sorry, I had a brain fart, we want the major product, okay? So this isn't to say other products won't Occur. This is just to say what is the the product we will get the most of. So in this first re uh, reaction box, like chlorine, less selective. We will definitely have some chlorination on the tertiary carbon, but chlorine will go where there are the most hydrogens. So these positions right here, they are all equivalent, right? This is isobutane. All of these three positions are equivalent. There are three hydrogens on each of these positions. They're all the same. So chlorine. It's just going to go where there's the most hydrogens. So, in, for this first problem, isobutyl chloride, we'll even name it because we are that cool, is the product we get. Okay? In the, the, main, the majority, right? And that can be over, like, it, it's not going to be a great split, but this is what people will expect of you when you do chlorination. Okay? 
So in this problem down here, now bromine obviously much more selective. What we're going to get here is going to be pretty much close to 100%, if not 100%. So is there, we're, we're looking for the most substituted carbon, right? Because that's going to be the easiest carbon to convert to a radical and then bromine can be stuck on at that position. So we see primary, secondary, primary, primary, ah, lovely, tertiary. That is absolutely where we're going to form our alkyl halide. Without a doubt, that is the product we will get, okay? Now, this reaction right here, iodine? We've never talked about using iodine, but will it work? Well, if you think about it, right? Chlorine to bromine to iodine. This is exothermic, this gets less exothermic. Well, this gets so, so exothermic, one step is endothermic. This, using I2, so endothermic, doesn't happen. So you can just slap a no reaction, NR, on anytime you see iodine in a free radical halogenation setting, okay? And in this last problem, I kind of wanted to get a little sneaky. So again, we like to put bromine in the most substitute, on the most substituted carbon when we do free radical halogenation. However, we need to have one hydrogen, right? Because in the mechanism, we saw that the bromine radical abstracts a hydrogen and produces a radical on that carbon. Well, unfortunately, this would be the carbon we want, but it's quaternary, right? It's two substituted. It doesn't even have a hydrogen there to abstract. It's, atta you know, it's attached to four different carbons. So the best we can do is this secondary carbon right here because every other carbon is primary. So our product is right there. Okay, gang, I hope this gave you some of the answers you may have been seeking in terms of this worksheet surrounding free radical halogenation and hyperconjugation. If you're watching this video, that means you've thrown me some money and you've supported JoeChem, and I can't even thank you enough. Thank you for using JoeChem as a tool to help propel yourself to conquering carbon. Thanks for taking me along for the ride. I hope I'm there to the very end. But if anything, I hope to see you in the next video.